sitting here with John Ringo, author of The Last Centurion, coming out from Bain Books. This is not a normal book for you. This was definitely a departure from the style that a lot of your fans have become accustomed to, even that you had become accustomed to. Exactly how did the muse hit to create The Last Centurion? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that it's a very unusual book, period. Uh, it's written in a style that, it's written in a way and a style that I'm not actually familiar with ever having been done. Uh, well, explain the style. What makes it so called different? called a blog poem. Um, the book is actually the, the blog-style memoir of a future military officer um, about six years in the future. And his experience is during a, uh, a global catastrophe. And it's written in a very blog style. It's, it's uh, the, the very, very most informal form of communication. Uh, as if he took a bunch of blogs and combined them and, and threw in some additions to explain things to people who aren't familiar with it. There is no dialogue in it. There is, uh, it is entirely first person. There's never a shift to second person or third person at all. The only other book I can think of that would most remotely come close to the style would be The Diary of Von Frank. Um, similar, yes. So it's a very intensely personal. Very much so, yes. Now, the interesting challenge of that as a writer is that, I mean, one of the things they always tell new writers is first person, stay away. Exposition, that, stay away. Not only that, but of course, the, one of the, the most famous things is uh, show, don't tell. Well, this is an entire book of tell. Nothing but tell. Nothing but tell. It is being a little less formal. Um, there's a, a thing called sea stories in the Navy. The difference between a fairy tale and a sea story is a fairy tale starts once upon a time, and a sea story starts, there I was, no lie. Nice to have Thank you. Um, but uh, it's essentially a, a guy just sitting down and telling about his experiences. And in a lot of cases, there's there's stuff that's written that's in this sort of strange code. That's, you become familiar with the code as you read it. But uh, his dialogue will, will be, you know, so and so will say something, and so and so will say something, and then when there's the pauses that someone has said something and it's an unsecretor, there's just a parentheses there. And the book is written. He is re he is basically retelling what had happened. Yeah, and it's not only that, but the the character had become relatively famous, including famous on TV. Right. So he's doing stuff that. He's talking about documentaries and then telling the backstory to how the documentary was made, which was already a backstory from something else. And yet, the people who are reading have never seen the TV shows. It's assumed in the book that everyone has seen the TV shows. So there's references to things that have no reference. That have no reference whatsoever. So as a writer, how how did you keep all this in your head? How were as you? As far as I can tell. Um, a worm snuck in through my ear. <laughs> um, they, they always say, where do you get your ideas? With the last centurion, no clue whatsoever. Um, I had no particular concept of the last centurion. It came out of nowhere. Um, and then it took me over. It, 153,000 words in its first draft. It was written in a net of nine days. Nine days? Nine days. Um, uh, nine very, very curious days that felt like dictation from the future. That this guy was actually whispering, Bandit Six was actually whispering in my ear and telling me the whole story. Where did it, was really, it was a really interesting story. Where did Bandit I Six no come from? You, I really don't. You have never served idea. with or under anybody like that? No. Bandit is one of the standard terms that's used for a Bravo company, but sometimes they're called Bobcat, sometimes they're called uh, anything else starting with a B. Um, and uh, so he was a B, you know, a Bravo company commander, a B company commander, uh, as in, in a battalion, it'll be A, B, C, D companies. And he was a Bravo company commander. The nickname of that particular Bravo company was Bandits. And so he became Bandit Six, and he kept the moniker ever since. It's, it's not, it's, it is his nickname in a way, but it's more like the, his online tag. It's the kind of thing that he'd use for Yahoo or AIM chat. Or like a, a, a MySpace page. A MySpace page, which 
has, <laughs> which is true. And, you and go he's look actually, for Bandit Six on MySpace, you'll find him. And he's he's actually I, one of my readers. No, is is also on MySpace mm -hmm. and has the Bandit Six page linked to her MySpace. <laughs> and a woman that she knows wants her to hook her up with, her up with Bandit <laughs> Six because he seems like you know really hot. <laughs> <laughs> The photo used <laughs> is taken from a former company commander of mine, digitized, turned into black and white, and basically done with a watercolor wash. <laughs> His own wife wouldn't recognize the photo. <laughs> well, it's not the photo. Hot. It's not the photo. It's the you know the, the general background description and the fact that he's, he is described as being you know, extremely tall. Mm -hmm. that we know. Did uh, she not catch the part where he's married? Um, so she. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you have real life people leaning on the character that came to you. Oh, come what, on. Nine day I've got an Islamic fatwa against one of my original <laughs> characters. Okay. <laughs> so I was the world saying, is a very, very strange place. When they say truth is stranger than fiction, they're right. <laughs> so you're at, I mean, seriously though, you are used to having some extreme reactions to the books that you've written before. However, those of us that have read the you're last... Riot in Berkeley. Yeah. The, the uh, last centurion, I think, is going to ratchet that up to levels so heretofore unseen. With any luck at all, yeah, there will you know, be riots and stones. <laughs> and while you've written a lot of military fiction, great Centurion is different in that, yes, the tactics are accurate, they're believable, but the focus of the book is not necessarily the military action, it's the science behind the book. You basically take two very push-button hot topics right now, which is a global pandemic and global climate change. Right. And you turn them on their heads. Uh, pretty much, yeah. So explain explain the pandemic and the climate change. Well, the the global pandemic is H5N1, avian flu virus, uh, becoming human to human transmissible, and, and a, a widespread pandemic across the world that kills about 50 percent of the human population. Um, and it gets a lot into the book. The book is not particularly dry. Uh, I know a number of people who've read it. It's available already online as an e-arc. Um, and there are some people who, you know, some reviewers who have said, you know, Mika, my eyes closed over. Um, but in general, it's not considered particularly dry. And yet, it covers fairly in-depth virology, epidemiology, solar physics, agriculture, um, military <laughs> tactics, military history, general history, it, it, it's all over the place. Even down to the fact of which cultures suffered more or fewer deaths by the avian flu based on the cultural dynamics. Based on cultural virus. dynamics, uh, and there are a few things that I threw in there. It's an interesting mishmash of current theory, shall we say, the theory of the some theories that are that are considered very very uh, poorly by certain groups, um, but are nonetheless good hypotheses, um, and then some things that were thrown in there just to completely throw people off, like hormones, you know, protecting people from the flu. Um, probably that's complete bull. But one of the interesting things is that's in this book is that when SARS broke out. In every other country that it hit, there was a high death rate. And yet, the exact same bug, when it came to the United States, was the, the effect was termed MARS, mild acute respiratory syndrome. No one died. People died in Canada, but people did not die in the United States. Um, and why is, is one of this book, doesn't really attempt to answer the question, but it, it, it it, it's an attempt to phrase the question, what was the difference? In a pandemic, will certain differences about the United States versus other 
high, highly developed, absolutely civilized, you know, fully industrialized information technology countries, will there be a difference? Because with SARS, there very, very clearly was. Why? Nobody's really been able to answer that question. Was there a slight genetic change? Maybe. And that's not even the most controversial part of the book. No, not by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Now, the most controversial part of the book is that it has, a, an epi it has a racial epithet in it uttered by the main character about a person. And it's black racial. And that, I, can, I am dead certain that if this makes any sort of a stir whatsoever, that is what's going to be seized upon, guaranteed. And yet, that's not all. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's, there's more. more. <laughs> Global climate change. Of course, a hot, you know, huge issue. You mean everything day. that they used to call global warming? Right. Okay. See, I, and we're not calling it global warming because you go in the opposite, much chillier direction. And uh, yes, I do. And and one of the hypotheses that's covered in here is that climate is driven. There are a lot of things that drive weather. Okay, weather being what's happening outside right now. Um, climate. The Earth is a ball of steel. Iron, nickel iron, which is in the middle of an ultimate deep freeze that gets very, very close to zero Kelvin. The only reason that it's warmed up at all is because of background radiation. Um, if it wasn't for the sun, it'd be a, a ball of frozen iron. Well, the sun keeps it warm. Um, all of the standard climate models take the sun as stable. Absolutely, 100% stable. The sun isn't factored into climate models at all. Despite the fact that it's a huge freaking ball of fusing hydrogen and helium, um, which we know isn't stable. And at this point, we now have satellites that are out there that are tracking the sun and finding out how stable the exterior is, and finding that, you know, they say, people who are proponents of the sun doesn't matter say, if the sun cut back by 10%, then, you know, the earth would have frozen 50 million years ago. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, a lot more than 50 million years ago. Lord Kelvin proved that. Um, but... <clears throat> 10%? Does it vary by 10%? No, it does not vary by 10%. But a 1% variation in the sun is a huge amount of energy! <laughs> it's a really <coughs> freaking enormous amount of energy! And yet this hypothesis that you're using in the book flies in the face of what the mainstream media is pushing, which is global warming. Global warming. In the book, it talks about global cooling because the sun backs off by a quarter of a percent, essentially. A quarter of a percent, one day's output, a quarter of a percent of the sun exceeds all the nuclear weapons that could be made on Earth using all of the known, all of the known sources of weapons-grade material. <laughs> a lot of energy. It's a lot of energy. And that's just the amount that hits the Earth. So there's going to be a lot of controversy about your approach to global climate change. And the interesting thing about the book is that you tackle it head on, or more appropriately, Bandit Six tackles it head on, yeah. with some very convincing, believable science. Um, that's because that science actually is... That's, I didn't play fast and loose with the global warming stuff at all. It's all very provable science. Um, and... What's interesting about it is one of the ways to track solar output has to do with sunspots. Um, sunspots do not make things warmer. Sunspots are an indication that the sun is putting out more energy. And the sun goes through these cycles. And everybody knows that the solar cycle is 11 years long. Most people know that the solar cycle is 11 years long. The solar cycle is an average of 11 years long. The lower the period, of the solar cycle, the longer it is. Okay, and now they've been able to figure out 
how strong a solar cycle is about 25 years out, but the technology, we're actually in a gap. They've got the technology to figure out the next solar cycle, but not the one that's just um, coming up. And in the book, it talked about how the sunspots didn't start appearing, and it appeared that the sun wasn't putting out any energy, and how things, over a two-year period, it seems very fast in the book, but it's a two-year period, how things got very, very cold very quickly. Um, there's currently a, an excellent theory that indicates that you can have a full-fledged ice age within 20 years. Um, sufficiently low solar output, um, and you can have a full-fledged ice age in 20 years. Because once ice ages get started in the northern climes, it's very hard to stop them because the Arctic Ocean is cut off from current flow. Um, so once they get started, they're really hard to stop. You need a lot of energy to stop them. Um, and uh, the funny thing about it is I read it last March. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was no indication that there was going to be a lack of sunspots any time in the near future. Solar cycle 24 looked like it was going to be perfectly normal. Solar cycle 24 has yet to, it, you know, it's official, it has an official start date, but, but there's certain numbers of sunspots that say, okay, the solar cycle has started. Solar cycle 24 has yet to actually start. It's two years into the solar cycle. Um, so, the predictions having to do with solar in the book are current day coming true. And in about two years, it will be interesting to see if my, and they were just, they were guesses as to what the actual effect would be. Um, if it continues in the current trend in two years, we'll be able to see if I was accurate in the book. Which is interesting. Um, for those of you watching this video, these if you take just the avian flu, just a military situation, just a global climate change and global cooling, it may not seem rush out to the bookstore and buy a copy for yourself and all your friends. But what you did, what I found fascinating, was you took all these elements and then put it into the middle of a basically a political crisis in the United States, right. which deals with political issues that once again are not quite what we would consider mainstream, that you're taking a very conservative, almost libertarian slant, and being very critical of the party in power that you have in the book. Yes, and that is, of course, my politics, and there have been plenty of books that have been written in the opposite direction, um, but, uh, you know, I, I, if this thing becomes huge, and, you know, I'm castigated on, on all the major news channels, I fully expect the true Centurion book to come out from Michael Moore or something. <laughs> <laughs> I know of at least one network that will probably support you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I've got some negative things to say about Fox in there, too. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, there was there was one reviewer who said the wonderful thing about this book is that there's something in there to annoy, to annoy everyone. It doesn't matter um, your political persuasion, your yeah. scientific persuasion, this book will annoy you. You know, they, <laughs> one of my free readers is a true, died in the wool, you mentioned, libertarian, and he was very upset about some of the comments on libertarianism. Uh, <laughs> very upset. Well, yeah. He doesn't want to be my first reader anymore, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but what makes um, the book refreshing is the fact that you do tackle a lot of different views. Bandit Six has a very strict code and belief system. Bandit Six considers himself to be a moderate. Right. <laughs> he really does. Um, you know, he's, he's not really, really big into socialism. Um, but, for example, if you ask him about the New Deal, he's fine on it. You know, if, if there's a purpose to government that goes beyond the absolutely strict constructionist pre-1865 from his perspective. But, you know, he just doesn't like certain things that are going on. He considers himself a monarch. He'd vote Democrat in a heartbeat if it was a smart Democrat. I mean, he talks about the mayor of New York and the situation that occurred and the, you know, he's a Democrat, but I'd vote him because he's a good politician. Alright, to sum this up. Yes. <clears throat> If you were to meet somebody who has no familiarity with your work, mm -hmm. and you were going to hand them the book, mm -hmm. and give them a brief 
like a pitch. You can give them a reason why to, to buy, buy it. Why to buy the book? I'm going to have to send my kids to college soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, I'm not giving you a thing to work with. <laughs> so, if you were going to actually talk to somebody and give them another reason to buy the book that they would enjoy. <laughs> um, I never reread my stuff. I don't. I, I finish my books and I edit them, and then somewhere down the line, I might, you know, I might be in a situation where I have to have something to read. And I'll read one of my books, and I'll kind of like it. It'll be okay. Um, I think I've read that book probably fourteen times so far. Um, I think that anyone will find it interesting and compelling. Anyone who has any interest whatsoever science, military, or politics is going to find it interesting you know, for history for that matter. Um, Bandit Six, I, I really refer to him as a completely separate person. Um, we There is a website that was made. It, it is the website for this book from the point of view of Bandit Six. Um, and on it, at one point, he, he says, you know, the question has been raised why it says John Ringo on the cover. And Bandit Six's answer was that, that they, there were some problems with using Bandit Six as the as the author. So it's a pen name. John Ringo's a pen name. <laughs> um, actually, the true the, the truth is that it was the ghostwriter for Bandit Six actually got his name on the book. <laughs> I am the ghostwriter for Bandit Six, and Bandit Six has a very strong, very compelling voice. I haven't met anybody. I've met people who were bleed, nose bleedingly ticked off by the book, but I haven't found anyone who didn't, who wasn't interested in reading. You know, everyone has been interested in it because it's very compelling. I think the bet, I think the thing this book is going to do more than any other book you've read is it's going to start long, passionate conversations. <laughs> and I actually should say conversations. <laughs> The problem with it is that one side's got all the wines and the other one's got all the guns. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good note to end this song. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Kelly. Look forward to seeing the book.